no one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that the War of the Worlds would be adapted time and again for film, television, and music. No one could have dreamed that so many minds would regard this property with envious eyes. But slowly and surely, they wrote their scripts against us. <laughs> is one of the greatest science fiction stories ever written. Adapted for film, TV, radio, even a musical, it's become instantly recognisable and had a tremendous impact on the genre. But despite being one of the most important science fiction stories, none of the adaptations really seem to get it right. I don't just mean the design of the Martians, more on that later, but they all miss a fundamental theme of the novel. But first, a disclaimer. Let's get this out of the way. There's no single authoritative interpretation of a creative work. We all respond to art differently, so we're all going to draw different conclusions from it. I'm not trying to claim that my interpretation is the single most important one, and if you disagree with it, then that's fine. That's what art is all about. So what is it that all of these adaptations miss? What do they all get wrong? The answer is colonialism. The novel, as I'll argue, channels a deep colonial anxiety and challenges the reader to imagine what it's like to be on the receiving end of colonisation. And it's right there in the opening pages. Before we judge of them too harshly, we must remember what ruthless and utter destruction our own species has wrought, not only upon animals, such as the vanished bison and the dodo, but upon its inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the space of 50 years. Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? Almost every adaptation starts with the classic opening line, no one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century, and so on. But just a few paragraphs later, Wells lays out a core theme of the novel, and everyone just ignores it. Okay, let's step back a bit. To properly understand this, we first need to understand the man who wrote it and the time in which he was writing. Personally, I don't really believe in death of the author. On the one hand, it is possible to study a creative work entirely separate from the person who created it, but on the other, everything we make is indelibly printed with the person who made it. Our backgrounds, experiences, personality, subconscious or otherwise, it all gets put into what we make. Hence, it's vital to understand who H.G. Wells was when he was writing the book. Herbert George Wells was born in Bromley, Kent, in 1866. A lifelong socialist, he stood twice as a Labour candidate in general elections. Throughout his life, he condemned racism and advocated for universal human rights. It's therefore not surprising that his work would critique imperialism. He was also writing during the boom of invasion literature. As the name suggests, this was a genre of fiction which depicted the invasion of Britain and was immensely popular between the 1870s and the First World War, reflecting contemporary fears about Britain's decline as a world power. The War of the Worlds, published as a novel in 1898, when placed in its creative context, 
doesn't actually stand out as being that original. It was simply one of hundreds of stories about Britain being invaded. But whilst many of these invasion stories were nothing more than jingoistic pulp playing on paranoia about the Germans, the War of the Worlds was different. Peripatia is an ancient Greek word meaning a reversal of fortune. It's the moment in a story when the mighty are brought low and the low made mighty. It's also, in my view, the perfect summary of the dynamic in the War of the Worlds. Because all of the assumptions that the contemporary audience had about themselves and their empire were suddenly turned on its head. He starts by utilising some of the most common justifications for imperialism to expose how flawed they are. Looking across space with instruments and intelligences such as we have scarcely dreamed of, they see a morning star of hope, our own warmer planet, crowded only with what they regard as inferior animals. To carry warfare sunward is, indeed, their only escape from the destruction that generation after generation creeps upon them. The Martians invade because their planet is dying. This creates dramatic tension by generating sympathy for the Martians and apes on one of the most common justifications for imperialism, that it's essential for the country's own survival, that they have the resources that we need to survive and Anyway, they're inferior to us, so it doesn't matter. To the reader, this justification for the Martian invasion seems rather silly. Does their survival really warrant such wanton destruction? But that's precisely the question that Wells is posing to his readers, prompting them towards a reflection on why their country has invaded other lands. The people who witness the landing of the first Martian capsule decide to greet the visitors with peace, in the hope of creating dialogue. However, they're blasted into smithereens with the heat ray. This disgusts the reader. The people have done nothing to warrant such a hostile response. This could be a metaphor for how many native peoples greeted visitors with warmth, only to be met with destruction. Wells continually confronts his readers with scenes which could be applied to their own recent past. In a few minutes there was not a living thing left upon the common, and every bush and tree upon it that was not already a blackened skeleton was burning. The giant saved Woking Station and its cluster of houses until the last. Then in a moment the heat ray was brought to bear, and the town became a heap of fiery ruins. Never before in the history of warfare had destruction been so indiscriminate and so universal. Colonial powers often gloated about their technological superiority over the people they'd conquered. Yet here, the audience was humbled by the inability of the armed forces to defeat the invaders. For the first time, they were the ones on the receiving end of mysterious weapons which dispatched death en masse. In the novel, The Martians Feed on Human Blood, this is a pretty overt metaphor for the exploitation of labour and resources in colonised countries, literally sucking out the blood to feed the aliens. Throughout the novel, Wells exposes the hubris of humanity. The arrogance that there's nobody more intelligent or powerful than them makes their powerlessness against the Martians even more dramatic. Yet so vain is man, and so blinded by his vanity, that no writer, up to the very end of the 19th century, expressed any idea that intelligent life might have developed there. The chances against anything manlike on Mars are a million to one. This could be a reflection of Wells's anxiety that colonial powers had become too arrogant. He had recently lived through some of the most embarrassing British defeats, such as the Boer victory in South Africa in 1881 and the death of General Gordon in 1885, and may have reflected on how these were caused by, in some part, the arrogant assumption that the British were just naturally superior to the people they were fighting against. Was Wells trying to warn his audience that they were continually overestimating themselves until it was too late? If you think I'm reading too much into this, he lays it out pretty clearly for us in the text. 
For that moment I touched an emotion beyond the common range of men, yet one that the poor brutes we dominate know only too well. Surely, if we have learned nothing else, this war has taught us pity. Pity for those witless souls that suffer our dominion. I could go on, but you get my point. Wells placed his Victorian readers in the position of a helpless people at the mercy of a cruel alien race. Considering the type of person he was, and the time in which he was writing, it's difficult for me to read this as anything other than a thinly veiled metaphor for colonialism. The pathos generated by describing the destruction of the most powerful empire in the world confronted the audience with the uncomfortable realities of that empire. So, we've established that this is a pretty prominent theme in the novel, so... Why do no adaptations bother trying to explore it? The short answer is because it doesn't make a lot of money. The War of the Worlds is a great work of science fiction, the archetypal alien invasion story. This is enough for most people, so why would studios bother trying to challenge the audience with a commentary on imperialism? To make this video, I consumed the five major adaptations. The 1938 radio play, the 1953 film, the 1978 musical, the 2005 film, and the 2019 miniseries. The majority made no effort to incorporate this theme. Most of them use the term based on very liberally and have only a superficial resemblance to the novel. The 1938 Orson Welles radio play is a great dramatisation, but fails to look any deeper into the source material. Oh, and we'll talk about that mass panic in another video. The 1953 film works great on its own as a science fiction story, but doesn't get any deeper than a generic alien invasion flick. The 1978 musical is a brilliant era-defining album with performances from some of the most famous musicians of the time, yet never gets any further than just superficially telling the story. The 2005 film is basically 9-11 with aliens. Finally, credit where credit's due, the 2019 BBC miniseries managed to actually set it in the correct place and time, and does explicitly mention colonialism in one paragraph, but it's done in such a ham-fisted way, and feels so tacked on, that it does little to redeem what is largely a terrible adaptation. This version stirred some ire in the press, with accusations of having gone woke, which really just demonstrates that they haven't actually read the novel or anything else by famously political writer H.G. Wells. Okay, so I get that these productions had different interpretations of the novel and that's fine, but it's exhausting to see so many people shy away from an interpretation just because it makes us uncomfortable. The Steven Spielberg film wouldn't have sold as well if it had a commentary on American interventionism instead of being a straightforward post-9-11 attack on America film. Okay, one more thing. Why is it nobody gets the Martians right? H.G. Wells is a brilliantly descriptive, clear writer who makes it abundantly clear what the Martians are supposed to look like. They were huge round bodies, or rather heads, about four feet in diameter, each body having in front of it a face. This face had no nostrils, but it had a pair of very large dark coloured eyes, and just beneath this a kind of fleshy beak. In a group round the mouth were sixteen slender, almost whip-like tentacles, arranged in two bunches of eight each. So why does nobody follow this? Not a Martian. Not a Martian. Also not a Martian. In fact, we have probably the most accurate Martian out of all these big budget productions. Look, I get that filmmakers want to have their interpretation of the material, but sometimes the material is strong enough as it is and deserves a faithful adaptation. Is that too much to ask? The War of the Worlds works great just as an alien invasion story, and that's fine. But stories are much richer when we can interpret them on multiple levels. When we look deeper into the material, we not only get a better understanding of the story, but of ourselves. 
Literature is a mirror through which we look back at ourselves. Thank you.